It's my pleasure to welcome back Lei Zong Chan, uh, my friend and colleague for the last 25 years, who will speak to us today on some techniques for studying non-isolated singularities. Well, in fact, I am going to speak specifically about a definition of discriminants. So uh, I want a discriminant is a kind of uh, strange object because it has a, a classical definition. So I, I give you the classical definition first. So you you look at this map. Defined in the following way, here the, the variables is z, and here you find a0, ab minus 2, and you look at the polynomial zd uh, plus ab minus 2, zd minus 2, plus etc., plus a0. And then here you don't change anything. Okay. So what does it mean? It means uh, so the discriminant is exactly the following thing. You look at uh, the critical points of phi, and uh, the image the image of the critical point is the discriminant. Well, this is not classical definition because the classical definition is is a, a necessary and sufficient condition so that this polynomial does not have uh, does not have uh, simple roots. Um, but it's you can see it here. So if x belongs does not belong to delta of phi, it means exactly that um, uh, ZD plus uh, etc. ZD minus 2 plus etc. plus A0 uh, does not have, uh, has simple roots. OK. So you can see that uh, with this definition, that if you take any point outside delta phi, uh, you have a, a covering. So the covering is the following. If you look at c times cd minus 1 minus uh, the discriminant, so this is, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, not like that. If you look at phi minus 1 of c times cd minus 1 outside delta, so this this is a covering. Uh, of degree <coughs> precisely the you have exactly d roots and this gives you the d roots okay so uh, now this situation can be generalized in the following way because you see, this looks like what Tom or used to call this is an enfolding of of the of the function z gives z d. So you see, if a zero a d minus one equals zero, so this this gives you the map z gives z d, and if more generally you can have a situation the following situation. You have um, a map from Cn times C lambda in, into C times C lambda. And uh, 
I look at the germ at the origin, for instance, and now I consider a map from CN. So take an analytic function, analytic function, and you assume that zero, a complex analytic function, and zero is an isolated critical point. of the function, it's called f, this function. So you can do now what is called an unfolding. of f by doing the following thing. You just take, for instance, the, the quotient of C Z1 Z N by the ideal generated by F and the partial derivatives. And the fact that the zero is an isolated critical point implies that this has a finite dimensional. finite dimensional space. And uh, this is a, well, just for giving a name for it, this is called the Turina number. And uh, Turina number. Turina number. And uh, if, you, if you give functions, say, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma lambda, so that the class, the class uh, gives a base of this vector space. So I can define this unfolding here by giving the function from Cn times C lambda by this, uh, Z1, Zn, uh, uh, maybe lambda 1, no, not lambda 1, but uh, E1, E lambda is f. So you, you make unfolding of f means you add sigma of ei sigma i. And then you add the number e1 e lambda. So you can recognize that this unfolding here is exactly this, this one by using this function here because uh, if you look at this space here, so you, you can find a base of this space by taking one cd minus two. So it's just a particular case of this. So since you have this situation, you can consider the crit critical locus of phi. Then the restriction of phi to the critical locus is, is a finite. analytic map. So the image is a well-defined analytic subspace of, of uh, C times C lambda. And this could be considered as a discriminant 
this deformation. Okay. More generally, ah, so what is particular in this discriminant? So my claim is the following. I'm not going to give a, a detailed proof, but the claim is the following. If you take points outside delta phi but near zero, so there exists a neighborhood U, such that if you look in U minus delta phi, over this, this, uh, this neighborhood outside the discriminant, phi induces a locally trivial synfinite vibration. over u minus delta phi. So I have to be careful that when I say that induces, I don't specify, but of course it is in some neighborhood of v and v of 0, but in cn times c lambda, v is the neighborhood of 0 in cn times c lambda. And then it is something which you leave in this. <coughs> well, I don't explain, but people who know, for people who know this easy, for people who doesn't know, it is kind of uh, strange. But I just want to emphasize the fact that the, the, this statement here somehow characterizes the fact it is a discriminant. Characterized in the following way that outside the discriminant, outside the, the, the zero uh, set of uh, uh, delta phi, then you have a locally to your vibration. And that's precisely this idea I want to generalize uh, in the case you have non isolated singularity. Okay, since that's where you're headed, then I'll ask this question. So normally you would need some kind of Tom A sub F condition to control the vibration on the closure of your, on yeah. the boundary of the closure of your neighborhood. Yes. But we don't have that problem here because we have an isolated critical point, yes. so we're far away. Yes. But you're going to have to worry about this in a minute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so just to finish, I want to give you a, a general definition of a discriminant. given by Tessier. And uh, you consider a general situation like that, where f is a flat map. Uh, since you are going to consider the situation locally, we are assuming that um, f is separated. You don't need to know what does it mean, but well, you you can you can define like that. If you look at in the product, this product, you see, you have two times this. So this product is 
what you what you have here. If S over the point is just the product of X and with itself, and in this the the diagonal is closed. So I assume that F is separated. It means this property. So you can define the to be correct it should be omega one indexed by F, but usually people denote by omega x over s. These are the relative uh, differential forms of x over s. So it is by f. So it should, the, the correct notation should be that. And, uh, and if we assume that, so f being flat, so the, 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 the fibers of f are equidimensional. And uh, um, I assume that this dimension equals to d. So there is a, a criterion, a kind of uh, what we can call the simplicity criterion, which is well known in the case S equals the point. Uh, that simplicity criterion. So I assume that F is flat and uh, X is a point of big X and uh, S is the image of X. So the following conditions are equivalent. Uh, there is S isomorphism, so an isomorphism above S between uh, X, S, and uh, S times uh, C, C, D at X at S zero. Six, uh, second condition is uh, F minus one of F X is non singular. of dimension d at x under that condition omega 1 of f is locally free uh, over uh, of rank D at X. Okay, so these three conditions are, are true. So it implies that uh, you see the, the points which are good. So this looks like a, a kind of uh, implicit function theorem, if you want. The points which are good are precisely the points where things are like that. So this here would define the critical locus. S and X are arbitrary analytic spaces? Yes, for the moment it's arbitrary. The only thing we ask is the flatness. Flatness here and the, 
the fact it is separated. So the, the, the critical locus defined by by Tessier would be the following. If you I take D is uh, the, the dimension of the fibers, then you take the D fitting ideal of omega 1 of F. Define the critical locus. So what is the fitting ideal? Uh, omega 1 of f is uh, locally, so locally, everything here is local, locally at x. Omega 1 of f is, uh, is coherent, so it has a, a presentation like that. And uh, here it's defined by a matrix. And in this matrix, I take the P minus D times P minus D minus. And this generate. what we call the defitting fitting ideal of omega So there is a theorem which tells you that uh, the, the, this ideal generated by this minus does not depend on the presentation. OK. So this year assume that f restricted to the well to the critical locus. Let me call it C of F. Sorry, this is finite. So if the restriction here is finite, so he can define the discriminant of F as the image. So exercise now. <laughs> it's not completely obvious, but it's not difficult. So locally, locally, uh, F induces uh, um, locally trivial. infinite vibration above. So if I take the notation of before, u minus delta f. So I don't, I don't detail this assertion, but it, it, is, it looks like the assertion I gave before. It means there is a, a neighborhood v uh, of x in big X, uh, so that above this, uh, f will induce a locally trivial vibration, as I said before. So here also, you don't need, you don't need the, the term condition, because uh, the fiber of a 0, the fiber of a s, I'm sorry, uh, is uh, is non-singular outside small x, because this is finite. OK, so that's <laughs> OK, so today, I want to extend uh, 
this notion of discriminant to a more general situation, but now I am not going to have any more the infinite vibration. Okay. So now the situation is the following. I consider X. So I still see the germ here. So I take a representative of this germ in some neighborhood of X in Cn. And um, I want to define um, a projection of that. Now, for the moment, I only consider projection on Ck. So, uh, so projection. Projection means uh, restriction of some linear projection of this on C K. Not yet. Something more complicated, you'd embed the graph in CN and then do linear yeah. projections. Yeah. For the moment, I, I do nothing. I say I want to define a, a discriminant for a projection in this situation. In general, you cannot do that. You need to ask this projection to be general. So, right. so the theorem will be the following. Uh, let P be a general projection. I will define that afterwards. Then there is A space gamma uh, inside CK uh, delta maybe sorry delta inside CK such that now you have a map so there is a neighborhood U V of X in X and U neighborhood of zero in C K such that so you have now um, V uh, v intersection with uh, f minus 1 of u minus delta over u minus delta is a locally trivial <coughs> C0 vibration. C zero vibration. So of course, this delta is not canonical. But as long as you know what the, what do you mean? It's not. You mean that if you vary the generic the general projection, you don't get. It's not canonical. It means that I can, if I get the delta, I, I can uh, I can change the delta by adding some other components. I will have the same result. Oh, okay. um, 
I have no way. Well, I, I'll show you. I can I can define a delta related to a, a stratification of x, but not. If I change the stratification, then I have to change delta. So you're going to get something that's kind of stratified to infinity vibration. So see infinity when there's strata, Continuous in general. Yeah, it's only it's, it's only continuous. It's, it's because of uh, yeah. when you have singularities, you cannot have infinity things. So here it's kind of surprising because now x can be extremely singular, and the singular locus of x could be bigger than k. So a priori, it can be very bad. But is, according to this theorem, it's not that bad. It is rather bad, but it's not that bad. OK, okay so how do you do that? To do that, you stratify. X. So X now is, is a representative of the germ. And uh, you stratify with uh, Whitney conditions. Well, if you don't know what is Whitney condition, in fact, at the end, you will, you will have a, a proper definition. I thought you were going to say Google it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry? Well, yeah, yeah. This is an analytic germ. In space over there, an analytic space. Right? Delta is an analytic space. Yeah, yeah. delta, I, I, yeah. when I say yeah, space, right. is complex analytic space. Of course, since you're over here in homeomorphism land, it wasn't completely clear. Yeah, right. you can assume that this is reduced. OK, so you certify that with this. And I claim that if you look at SI and you project F SI on CK, if the dimension of SI is smaller than K, then then I will, I will uh, embed SI in something I shall call the critical locus. I call C. So in some sense, they are not very important. They are too small. Now, if SI has dimension more than K, then you can observe the flowing thing is if the if the projection is generic is general enough if i restrict to si the critical locus of that is something in si and it's defined by a linear system SI, I'm sorry, but I say when I say uh, a stratification with Whitney condition, stratification means each strata, the closure and the boundary is a complex analytic space. So, so this will be a, a linear system on SI, and so the, the singular point of this linear system is either in the singular point of, S, of, uh, of SI bar, if you want, of SI, but SI is non-singular, and uh, uh, in the fixed point of the linear system. But the linear system has no fixed point. Okay, so this is 
So this is either always empty, it's possible, or it is something of dimension equals to k minus 1. So in that case, I call this, I call the closure of this gamma i. And so it has dimension k minus 1. So now we just take delta delta will be uh, the image by f of by phi of the gamma i union the image by pi of si bar. So for that, I, I have chosen a, a general pi in such a way that this this critical locus is either empty or the dimension k minus 1, and it is non-singular. So now I'm using Tom Mother isotopy theorem. to say that outside delta, I have a vibration, as I say. OK. So part of the claim here is that pi is general enough that its restriction to gamma of i is finite. Yes. You may have said that. I was OK. No worry. Yep. OK. So now I can choose the projection pi. Now I can define for a general for a general. I have a quick question, just to make sure I follow. The uh, SI bars are the ones that are of dimension yeah. less than okay. yes. yes, in this one. So those are the small dimension ones. Yes. Oh. And here uh, dimension. This, this might be empty. So for, for a general pi, for a general pi, I have defined like that. We have defined. A general fiber. for pi and uh, so I can decide that I choose uh, pi in such a way this general fiber has the minimum Euler characteristic. The, not the minimal, but the generic Euler characteristic. characteristic. Not the Euler characteristic. Characteristic. characteristic of the fiber is <coughs> the general one. So in such a way, the fiber here I, I called with, I think I call it with Tessier. We have defined this uh, the vanishing fiber of dimension 
d minus k. So you can do that for k between uh, 2 and uh, d, or even d plus 1. But if you, if you choose d plus 1, then, then c equals the whole x. Can you not get? Sorry? Do you not get <coughs> general cohomology groups in every degree? For that? I mean, could you, why would you take something as weak as the Euler characteristic? Could uh, you say choose uh, pi because... I, I will say, tell you later. Oh, okay. You can choose, of course, you can choose, of course... To make the cohomology. The, the, not the cohomology, but the, the fiber itself. Because the, the, the topology of the fiber itself, or the homotopy type, or whatever you want, is interesting. But I am choosing the Euler characteristic. Okay. Right. Because I want you to give you another characterization of the Whitney condition right. using these type of things. OK, so. So I, I have defined like that uh, the earlier characteristic uh, for d minus 2. So d minus 2 uh, is, um, is the dimension of the fiber until d minus d minus 1 uh, so and the last one is 0 so well maybe it's better to do like that and this one is equals to the generate Euler characteristic for dimension 0. Dimension 0, this gives you the multiplicity. It's a number of points when you project exactly the multiplicity. OK. So this family of Euler characteristic, I call it the vanishing Euler characteristic of x at small x. So it defines you a family like that. Then assume that you have a stratification. So I remind you that a certification here means it satisfies the, the frontier property, means the each, each, close, each closure of SI is a union of strata of lower dimension. Okay. So consider such a certification. And so look at the Euler characteristic of SI at points of SI bar at, at points of SJ if SJ is in SI bar. I, I take all pairs SI, SJ so that I have this, this inclusion. So I, here I have a. <laughs> so I consider the vanishing Euler characteristic of SI bar 
at each point, uh, at each point maybe y is, I should do. So I have all these families. And I assume that this is constant along Sj. is constant along SG. And so this is for all S S S J S I so that S J is contained in S A I and bar. And so this is equivalent with the condition. Does this constancy relate to the constancy of the yeah, of course. Yeah, the series map is like this is actually yeah. It it is obtained like that. It's obtained like that. But it is uh, the advantage of this presentation is it works on real numbers, but I don't understand what it means for real numbers. You can you can try to do the same thing for real numbers because what In real analytic spaces. Real and yes. <laughs> I mean, people, people who wants to use reals. <laughs> I don't know. I don't use reals. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, so it gives you a, a, a general characterization like that. So. So they, I, I will end my lecture by okay, giving a, a, a conjecture. Well, I think it's, it's true, but I'm too lazy to prove it. Assume you have a, a map from x to s. Well, let us do in general. Assume that this map is maybe flat. I, I, it's not really important, but it's, it's just to fix the, the dimension. And assume that the fiber of S so phi, the fiber of S has isolated singularity. X relatively to a witness stratification, a witness stratification of X. So prove that, prove that phi has a topology code discriminant. So topological code discriminant means it's a dadaitic subspace of S so that on the complement is locally a, a, a topological code phi version. If you Do you mean that x over s is different from singular? Is that an assumption? x over s is? Within the singular, considered the no, 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 no. No? No. No, I don't think. I don't speak. It's just flat, and I just no, ask. No, you said x. 
might be an isolated, might be a point strata mm -hmm. that messes up. Oh, I see. Okay. The uh -huh. other less weaker figures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. Trivial, trivial. Watch that. Ooh, sorry. Leave it. Just leave it. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know. It's uh, the only interest of the lecture is that uh, I just want to attract that the interest to the, the maybe topological is not the term, but you don't need to look at um, uh, the vibration process, the C infinite vibration process you have in the general discriminant. What is important in some sense is just the topological result. And eventually, uh, this has application. I don't know. But what is interesting is you study non isolated singularity in that, in that way. So it gives you a method. So you yeah, I'm stopping right. here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there are there questions for John? Comments? I have some questions. Go for it. Um, Mather proved something about a nice range of dimensions and uh, for projections. Could you remind us of what he proved and tell us if it's relevant? The nice range? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. What did he prove? Who? Mather. John Mather. Atom mother. John. Atom John mother. Terry would know if he were here. In fact, Terry knows even though he's not. No. <laughs> here, here I don't look at the... Uh, at, uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with a nice range or not, because I always consider flat situations somehow. No, but you talked about projections before. Yes, but the projections I consider are always with the dimension of X is more than the dimension of, of the base. It, when you consider the nice... Uh, uh, it has higher dimensions. Yeah, yeah, you, you, uh, you in, in bed. Uh -huh. It's something a bit different. But <laughs> I, I don't think... I, I think the, the question is interesting because I always... I observe that... Uh, if you look at the nice range, it is dual somehow to this viewpoint. But I don't know how dual it is. <laughs> Something like that. OK, the other question concerns this book by Gelfand and two of his students. One of them oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how is their definition of discriminant related to what you told us? Well, the definition, the definition of discriminant is related to the first Presentation I did before this year's definition. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, really it's the same it's, definition. It's, yeah, it's something like that. It's a map, but they only look to map from either either CN to CK, and the, the fiber has isolated singularity on the origin, or from X to CK, but still the fiber of a the special point has an isolated singularity. That's what you look at, no? No, no. What I'm looking at, X is has many singularities. So, uh -huh. so in terms of singularity, the fiber of the S is very singular. It has a lot of oh, singularities. A higher dimension. But it, it does not have many singularities in terms of the stratification. So you see, the fiber of the S mm -hmm. is transverse to all the strata except in X. Imagine a, a space with a non-isolated singular singularity. Then mm -hmm. just take a one linear form, take a linear form where you've got a point stratum, and the linear form. Pick your linear form just so that the hyperplane is transverse to all the stratum except the point strata. Mm -hmm. Then, um, then it would be this kind of thing. It would be it would have an isolated relative critical point at that point stratum. But even though the space itself is 
arbitrarily singular. Yeah. When you see hyperband arrangement, is typical of that. You have a mini, mini hyperplane, very high dimension. They, they, the configuration is very complicated. You have many singularities, stupid singularities, but there are singularities. And if you cut by, by a linear form, then you, the linear form at zero, it, it, it has, the intersection has a lot of singularities. But in terms of stratification, it has only maybe only a singularity at the origin. You know, if we don't want to offend the hyperplane people, we're going to have to edit out the part where you said they're stupid singularities. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Interesting. Singularities. Yeah, well, when I first started looking at hyperplane arrangements, I thought, well, this has got to be easy. I mean, how hard could it be? A bunch of hyperplanes intersecting. Yeah, what a mess. What a mess. And in a way, resolution of singularities kind of tells you it's the fundamental mess. So, do you have more questions? I have a couple. Please. So, you said that your delta wasn't canonical, and then I didn't understand what you meant at the time, but after you presented it, I realized you meant, oh, well, you could add extra Whitney strata that you didn't need, and then their, their projections would, be, um, would give you more delta. But then there's Tessier's canonical Whitney stratification, the best one, the coarsest one, or the, or the, yeah, the best one. So, in that sense, you could make delta canonical, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then my other question was, what? What's this about dealing with the reals? What would you do over the reals? Which? But, uh, over the reals, I mean... Uh, you mean just the idea of looking at topological you, stratification? You, you, can, define, you can define projections well, of this true. type, but then you see, you, you, you may have projection on a real like that, You can uh, define the, a general fiber, but you m might have several general fiber. Is it even, I know so little of the reals. Is it true that the, the proper image of a real analytic set is real analytic? No, but it's sub-analytic. Ah, right. So when your, the time, your category, what you mean by spaces, would have to change? No, because, for instance, you, you, you will have zone about where it is empty and zones where it is not empty, for instance. Yeah, but there where you were saying your delta is a space, now space would have to mean a semi-analytic set, right? Well, if and you speak so about algebraic, okay. algebraic real geometry, yeah. so you can yeah. speak about semi-algebraic sets, and right. I don't know. Or probably, probably what, sub-analytic or something. Sub-analytic, that, oh, in fact, that is what sub-analytic is. Yes. The proper images of, yeah, right. How the reals. Um, I think that was, those were my only questions. Anybody else have questions or comments? All right, well, let's thank John again.